Hi, Dan Tokar at the Willow Forge in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Uh, I've started a new line of uh, YouTube videos uh, that I'm thinking of coaching videos. Uh, and the first sort of request I've got is uh, on forge welding and how to do the scarves uh, and other preparations so that you get a nice, clean, smooth weld that uh, blends in entirely. Uh, but this question presumes that you want the uh, forge weld to disappear entirely. And I, I tell you uh, that this isn't always the case. Uh, there's a whole class of things uh, from the old days where they didn't try and hide forge welds because it really wasn't important. Uh, or if they did make a forge weld, um, it wasn't important enough to make it disappear because they could hide uh, the scarf line somewhere in the work where it wouldn't be obvious. So what I did is I looked through my piles of stuff in the shop and I found enough old work that has forge welds to show you different examples of this. So that'll be the beginning phase of this and then later on I will actually get the fire going and show you how to do a forge weld uh, with various types of scarf that uh, will help you hide uh, or blend in the weld entirely. But anyway, simplest case first. This is a hasp bolt and that's old paint on there and you can see how they scarfed and welded uh, that eye without bothering to uh, entirely blend the scarf into the work and you can see on the other end of this eye bolt that there is the scarf you can actually quite clearly see I'll point to it that's the end of the scarf So that's a very clean forge weld, but still, they didn't bother to hide the weld. This is a pair of 200-year-old hinges, and they looped the stock around to make the eye, and I wire brushed this lightly, but you can see that's the end of the scarf on both of these. They didn't bother to blend it entirely because it was going to be on the part of the hinge that was up against the wall or up against the, uh, the door so you wouldn't see it anyway. So they didn't bother to blend in um, the forge weld. Another example of that is, this is a long forge welded bolt. And by that I mean they made the head on that bolt by wrapping a bar of stock around the top, welding it on and forging it square, and you can see the scarf joint where that loop that they welded onto the end of the bar to make the bolt head doesn't disappear. It's still very obvious. And this was a bolt that was in service for over 150 years. And it didn't bother it a bit. You can see the weld is pretty tight around the shaft. But they made no attempt to hide that scarf. One more instance. This is a pair of tongs that were made by Mr. Hughes, a blacksmith I actually knew when he was 80. So I know these tongs are probably about 75, 100 years old. It's Mr. Hughes's mark. But you can see he welded, forge welded the reins on the pair of tongs. And right there, 
that's the end of the scarf where he welded the reins on this pair of tongs. And if you look on the other one, it's almost invisible. There it is, right there. That's the end of the scarf. He was just doing a good weld, and if it entirely disappeared, he was happy enough. Now, here is a basket handle. I'll try and get as close as I can with that. But you can see, that's very carefully welded on and I could not find the end of the scarf anywhere in that and the bars blend in pretty well same thing with up top so on some of the finer work they wanted the forge well now here is pipe tomahawk that I made well it's in progress it still has to be uh, finished out it's got the basic shape but I still have a lot of file work to do and I have turned the bowl on the lathe and that was actually turned on the lathe after I had welded this all together now I know five different methods that they made pipe tomahawks. They weren't all made the same way. And that bowl is forge welded on to the stock that made the tomahawk. And you cannot see a joint where that bowl was welded on. The weld for the eye, it's kind of obvious that you can see where my finger is is where your hammer and the anvil would be when you're welding that and that's of course where the welding ends it's very hard to actually weld inside the eye so there's always this transitional port of the eye of a tomahawk where the weld isn't quite stuck together because you could only hammer it right there you can't get that last stock thickness down so you always have that transition but the rest is welded pretty seamlessly it's actually a french pattern tomahawk with that cute little kirk that little thing on the body and the shape of the bowl is sort of a tulip shaped. At some point, I'll have this finished out and I might show you what the, uh, the tomahawk looks like when it's done. I got rudely interrupted by a train. Anyway, I have a length of half inch round hot roll. And what we're going to do is upset a section about five or six inches from the end. Uh, where the weld is actually going to take place and the reason you want that section a little heavier is so that when the scarf comes around you can weld it and blend it and have it end up being the same thickness as the rest of the bar without having a visible um, scarf line so first thing we have to upset a section in the bar where the weld is going to be Okay, we've got the bar hot. I've got my one pound ball peen hammer that I'm going to use to upset this thing. Pull it out. Fire brush it off a little bit. Got that. Stick out. it's going a little off center but I will straighten it oh 
you can see that what I did was straighten it back out again. But the, where I upset it, it's a little bit thicker than the rest of the bar. All right, so I heated up the end of the bar. And what I'm going to do is make a scarf joint, a scarf, about two to three times the length and the diameter of the bar. So the length of the scarf joint should only be for a half inch stock, something like an inch to an inch and a half long. And you want a fairly thin edge at the end. And you want it to be slightly crowned at the very end. So that's my scarf. And I have enough heat that I'm going to Bend this around. Make a loop that puts that scarf, that paper, on the heavy section. Well, I'm going to have to heat that up. All right, I corrected my loop. Now you can see that the scarf is over the thickened section and the scarf is not too long and it's not too sharp either. And I will put a small amount of borax. You don't need a huge amount. You just need enough borax to glaze the surface. Flux is not glue. It's just to clean off the oxides and protect the metal at high temperatures. <coughs> Great. And that will go back in the fire. I'm going to put my goggles on too. All right, I put the prepared loop back into the fire. I've got to get it up to a nice, even, bright yellow on both sides. So when it gets close to the right temperature, I will rotate it 180 degrees so that I'm sure both sides are nice and hot. One of the indicators I have in a coal fire is that the borax flux will start to volatilize and you'll start seeing a sodium yellow uh, flame color as some of the flux begins to burn off. For mild steel, that's a forge welding temperature. I have a small disadvantage with forge welding with all these lights on. It looks pretty dark to you guys, but that's because I have a uh, cut filter on the camera right now. But otherwise, the forge weld would look like it was a uh, magnesium flare coming out of the fire. So in order for you to be able to see anything and not have the glare overwhelm it, I've had to uh, turn up all the lights and put a 25% pass filter on the camera. And turning the work over in the fire, I'm just beginning to get a little bit of yellow flame or I should say orange or yellow flame. It's a slightly different color than the yellow flame you get in a normal coal cook fire. The other thing is, is the sequence of blows. When I pull this out and weld it, you want to try and weld the thinnest section first and work toward the heavier because you've only got eight or 10 seconds before that little thin edge cools off enough that it's not at a welding heat anymore. And that can also leave a bigger scar on the end of your scarf that won't blend in. That little thin edge cools off very quickly. So it's important to hit that first. The body will be hot enough for maybe 45 seconds. Getting close here. I 
to slow down my air because the fire is hot enough, but with less air, it's less likely to burn, and you still have the heat from the coat that's already hot in the fire. rod so that I close the edges down. Now that's welded, but in order to blend it a little more, I'll take it back up to a welding heat and forge it some more. As you can see, it's much fatter in the center section. You put it back in the fire. And that's the other thing is that a lot of things, you can kind of get it stuck together with one weld, but there's nothing in the rule book that says uh, that you can't weld it several times to help blend it and stick it as long as you haven't reduced the thickness or burned it up. So I'm going to take a lighter second welding heat just to help blend it and move it all together. I hope you also paid attention to the fact that I angled my hammer when I was striking on that so that I could hit the uh, thin edge, the tapered section of the scarf. You don't have to hit it that hard if it's at the right temperature, but you do have to hit it in the right place. soak for a second. Got my hammer, get ready. And I'm going to try a third weld on here just to make sure I get everything stuck together.
All right. Third will. Take a close look at this and see whether I succeeded. Well, I have a weld that blends nicely, but I did put one little hammer dent in just the wrong spot. But otherwise, the scarf disappeared. See the two pieces are still stuck together, so it must be a reasonably good weld.
put the coarse points on both of these before I put the fine points so that they don't burn up.
I've got a point. Now I'll have to get the long ones into a graceful poker point. I'm also continually putting green coal in on the chimney side to make coke to work toward the fire. If I work it on the chimney side, all that smoke goes up the chimney. That's a poker shape. That's a poker shape that I'm quite fond of. That little bit of recurve. All right, I'm going to take the filter off the camera. piece of cardboard behind it. Aside from setting the cardboard on fire, you can see I have one little hammer ding that shouldn't be in there, but basically the welding scarf has disappeared into the bar And you get a nice graceful transition to the two parts of the poker.